This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back. What you're about to hear is the first episode of Fireline, a six-part podcast about what wildfire means for the West, our planet, and our way of life. We've been working on this series for almost two years now and are super excited that release is finally here. I'm joined today by my partners in this project, Victor Iveas and Nick Mott. These two did the writing, producing, and editing, and I'm extremely proud of the work they've done. Fellas, thanks for stopping by today. Thanks so much for having us, Justin. Yeah, thanks for having us. So, Victor, let's start with you. You're a recent graduate of the University of Montana's journalism program and now interning with National Public Radio's Throughline. Why did you want to get involved in this project? When I saw that you were looking for, you know, some help on it initially, I was immediately intrigued. Um, I've always wanted to get into long form audio, just audio in general, but especially long form and especially around the environment. And I mean, wildfire is really something that is part of life, especially in the West, but or in Missoula and especially the West. But um, yeah, so I was just really excited to see that there was an opportunity for it and I was excited to reach out to you, and I'm glad that I did. Indeed, as am I. And Nick, you joined the team a little bit later. Your producing credits include the Peabody Award-winning Threshold, and as well as Montana Public Radio's Outstanding Richest Hill. Man, why did you answer my call? <laughs> um, you know, my I'm really, really fascinated by wildfire, and that story starts with when I left where I'm from, which is uh, Kansas City an area where there was like no exposure to wildfire. I was from, grew up like in the suburbs of Kansas and, you know, farther west, there is a long history of wildfire on the plains and the tall grass prairie. But I didn't know about that until much later. Um, like one of my first jobs out of undergrad was was doing conservation work out west in uh, Nevada and California. And in the Tahoe area, I was doing fuels reduction. And that's when I first learned this sort of predicament we've put ourselves in around wildfire and also one of the narratives that we hear about in the series about the legacy of, of fuel suppression. And that's also when I've first experienced smoke plumes in wildfires. And it's been, it's just been an object of fascination for mine for, for a decade now. And uh, I keep learning more and I'm excited to, for the series to come out. And yeah, I can't express how much I've learned reporting and editing and producing it. Yeah. Let's talk about the learnings here. I mean, Victor, we'll start with you. Like, you know, talk about what you've learned, but also talk about maybe some of what uh, some of the surprises along the way, like things that maybe, you know, you had preconceived notions that were just, um, you know, turned around based on your learning through this project. So I feel like I've learned so much, like I can't even, you know, condense that into a, a single conversation. Um, just, and everybody has, I think one of the big things that really stuck with me is everybody has a feeling about wildfire. Everyone has an opinion on it. Everyone has an experience with it, especially living in Montana and traveling to Idaho and talking to people, individuals there for the series um, and being able to talk to people all over the West. Everyone has an experience with it and everyone has a story. And I think that, you know, it was really, for me, it was really important to bring everyone's stories to life and with everybody's individual story, you know, there's a different thing that I learned as well. And I think I'm just really excited to, or I was really excited to put all those stories together with the team and um, for us to be able to get across what everybody throughout the West has learned through their individual experiences and turn it into Fireline. Yeah, I mean, I think that learning journey that you express really comes through, in, you know, in the script that uh, that we've created. Um, so many layers to it. Nick, how about you? What um, you know? What were the biggest lessons and, and any surprises along the way for you? Yeah, you know, almost everybody we talked with had one of the same messages throughout this process, which is, you know, we need to learn to live with fire, and that statement. That idea is what's really stuck with me throughout this process and what it means. Like The more I've learned about wildfire, the more meaning this notion, living with fire, ha has taken for me and what it means to live with fire as an individual, what it means to live with fire as a community, what it means to live with fire as 
a as a society um, at this sort of bigger picture level. And you know, I think you have to listen to the whole series to hear how all of those different things play out. But it really is a different way. There, there are really different ways of thinking about living with fire that are much more complicated. And I think that leave me with some optimism um, than I first had been thinking about it before this began. But Justin, I want to turn this around on you. You know, you're, you are the host of this podcast. You got it started. Like, why did this project begin for you? And what have you learned? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the same themes the two of you have touched on. You know, I moved to Missoula in 2012 and really had no experience with wildfire. I mean, growing up on the East Coast, you know, you occasionally would get like a hazy, smoky sky, but you could never really smell the smoke or the you know, fire was never really threatening. And then I lived, you know, in, in other areas where it just, for, for whatever reason, it, it didn't touch um, my life. And then moving here, the first fall, you know, I had a young baby and a two-year-old. And, you know, within a couple of weeks, smoke was engulfing the Missoula Valley. And my daughter was having respiratory problems. They moved back to Seattle for three weeks. So all of a sudden, I'm here by myself just realizing like, wow, I'm, I'm living in a different place now. And maybe this is, you know, people were sort of saying, oh yeah, this is Missoula's dirty secret, smoke season, etc." You know, and so adapting to that over time, spending times in wild places, kind of experiencing the way fire had shaped the landscape, uh, meeting people that work in the in the fire system, whether it's a land manager, a you know, scientist, colleague here at the College of Forestry, firefighters. I've met, I've met lots of smoke jumpers and, and hot shots and other people that put their lives on the line um, to protect us in many ways. You know, and I've been doing this podcast, uh, A New Angle, for a number of years, and I wanted to interview somebody in that space. And as I, as I thought about doing that, it occurred to me that, wow, this is, this is way more than just one interview with one voice, that there's so many layers to this, and that trying to do kind of a, a longer form treatment of the topic was really necessary to do it right. And uh, I certainly needed help with that. It was beyond kind of my experience and skill set, and so reached out to to you guys to, to, to help. And I should mention Jeff Hull, an independent journalist that helped in the early stages of the program. His voice is a part of this as well. And um, yeah, it's been a super interesting um, experience, both in terms of learning about the topic itself, but also going through the process of producing a piece of long form journalism has been really rewarding. I mean, my, my research background is in academic research, and this is certainly a different form of scholarship, a different uh, skill set, and uh, it's been really special to sort of learn from you all and, um, and all the, the amazing folks we've spoken to. So, that, yeah, that was kind of how it came to be. I haven't heard a bunch of that story, and I've been working on this thing for like a year and a half. That's really cool. Well, we just <laughs> um, grind through, right? Like we do these Zoom sessions, we do our work, and we go on to our other jobs. I mean, it's... it's uh, it's, um, you know, and then we're distributed, like Nick, you're in Livingston now, and Victor's in Helena, and, and we haven't really been able to meet in person, except for uh, you know, one trip up to the Jocko Valley that, that listeners will learn about in, in episode four, I believe. So yeah, I mean, we've got some, we've grown together in a digital sense, but um, our work has been pretty distributed. Yeah. I'm going to keep running with having turned this around on you, Justin. Sure, okay. um, today, listeners are going to hear... The first episode of the series, but what are you two excited for for folks to hear as the series keeps going? I'm super excited because I think that the story that we're telling about fire and wildfire is just different. I think that the perspectives that we bring in, the scenes that we bring in, the story that we're telling is not the story that you have heard before. And I think that's what excites me the most. You know, this isn't just one this isn't just the story of suppression. This isn't just the story of Smokey the Bear. Um, this is a story that goes back millions of years and, you know, as part of the human evolution and kind of, you know, trying to wrap that up in, in six episodes is difficult, but I think that we do it justice. And uh, I'm just really excited to share that, that part. Yeah. I, I guess I would add to that. I'm excited for, um, you know, that, emo that emotion I described that I first experienced in 2012 was one of kind of helplessness. 
that this was okay. This is just you know what living here is all about, and certainly smoke will continue to be part of living in the West, and you know, wildfire risk will be will continue to be a part of living in the West. But one of the kind of key insights of this show that I hope listeners come away from is, you know, we all have a role to play in living with fire. And there's things that we can do individually within our communities, within our families to try to create a more sustainable coexistence with the world around us. You know, we, we learn over and over again that as human beings, we are part of the natural world. We do not control it. It does not do what we want it to do. We are a part of it. And I think the issue of wildfire just sort of illustrates that in a really rich way. And, and hopefully we've made that that sort of duality of existence uh, pretty clear throughout the course of this this, this storytelling. But Nick, what are you th- sort of or what are you most excited for people to to learn and hear throughout the course of this series? Well, what you all said really resonates with me, and especially um, what Victor said about a story that isn't what people have heard before, and is or isn't what people have would expect to hear. During a couple of the most recent interviews I've done. Folks, especially firefighters, have really expressed like how frustrated they are with how the media covers wildfires a lot, all this doom and gloom, and it's sort of the same story that's really simple. You know, fire's bad, it's destroying a bunch of stuff. Um, and, you know, I think on the other side, too, the story can be reduced really simply like fire's, fire's good for ecosystems, but the story we tell is one that is nuanced and complex and has elements of so many different views of fires that I think is a story that I certainly coming into the show wouldn't have expected. Like this is this as, as reporter and producer and editor and all that, this took me on a journey that where I didn't expect to go. And I hope it'll take listeners on a similar journey. Well, let's hope so. And we should probably turn it over for listeners to experience this uh, show that we're really proud of. I can't thank the two of you enough for pouring your souls into this work And I'd also be remiss if we didn't recognize the support of our sponsors, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Montana Properties, First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, The Trailhead, and United Way of Missoula County. Also, special thanks go to Montana Public Radio and the University of Montana College of Business. So here we go with episode one of Fireline. And if you like it, please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app, write us a review, and tell all your friends about it. Support for this program comes from Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Montana Properties, First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and a New Angle Podcast. Late last summer, it felt like the whole country was up in flames. Coronavirus had turned life upside down, Election season was heating up, and across a lot of the West, things really were on fire. Raging wildfires have scorched a record number of acres and killed at least 31 people. If you listen to the news, fire was something catastrophic. The death toll continues to climb from those devastating wildfires. In Devastation California. and death, 15 killed in this area alone. Wildfires seemed out of control, and smoke was suffocating cities and towns across the West orange skies, thick smoke, walls of flame. Health officials have warned people to stay inside. This is something that's become all too familiar in this part of the country. Every summer, and sometimes in the spring and fall too, we hear the same thing. At unfolding situation, you were talking about 60,000 acres over like 600 homes and more than 300 commercial structures between Napa and Sonoma. I'm telling you all this because there's more than one way to think about wildfire. In this first view, what you've been hearing so far, it threatens our way of life. But here's another way of seeing fire. Hi, my name is Billie Jane Clark. In the background, you might be hearing some fire. That's what it is. Lily's a wildland firefighter. She recorded these messages on her phone and sent them to us while she was working on the August Complex, a burn in Northern California that sprawled over a million acres last summer and fall. I'm starting with Lily because I find her attitude towards fire really interesting. That whistling, that's the sound of a tree taking flame. 
Here, in the August complex, it's something she sees every day. I'm currently standing right next to it, if you're wondering how I can get that sound. But still, something beautiful and awe-inspiring. Part of the natural world, like the view from a mountaintop. The experience of a forest taking fire is really something. The way you can feel its energy, the way you can just watch the trees take it. It's part of her job to get up close and personal with fire, but she's still transfixed by it. Right now an oak tree is going up in flames. It's beautiful. The watching ember wash either cascade down the hills or right now fly up into the leaves of the trees and the limbs. The flames are encapsulating the trunk. And the embers just keep flying. So, in these two views of fire, there's fire as catastrophe, as something to be controlled and destroyed, wiped off the landscape, feared. And then, this fire is something natural, even beautiful. These two versions of fire fascinated me. They seem incompatible, almost like they're relating to totally different phenomena. But they're about the same thing. This podcast is an attempt to reconcile those two views of fire. Because the thing is, neither view is wrong. By just about every measure, fires are getting bigger, hotter, and more devastating than we've ever seen before. And here are some fairly depressing numbers. In 2004, for the first time since reliable records began, wildland fires burned more than 8 million acres in a single year in the U.S. That's about eight times the size of Glacier National Park. In the years since, that's happened nine more times. And researchers predict that number could double by the middle of the century. But if you zoom out, fires have been around for hundreds of millions of years, longer than humans have been around. Fires are a natural, even crucial part of ecosystems. From my perch as a professor at the University of Montana, I sit at an epicenter of wildfire history, science, and culture here in the West. And I didn't really understand it. So a couple years ago, I decided to dig in. I started this long journey that took me from a mine in rural Idaho. The fire was sucking the air out of the tunnel, so it was getting harder and harder to breathe. To the depths of climate science. You know, I'll, I'll talk about it in a calm way because I'm a scientist and I'm trying to be as objective as I can, but this is me hitting the panic button. To children's literature. And so I came home and I told Joe, my wife, I'm like, hey, I think, I think it'd be fun to write a kid's book. And she's like, what? I'm Justin Angle, and this is Fireline a series about what wildfire means for the West, our planet, and our way of life. This is episode one, Suppressed. We are uh, sawing along the road to clear off the smaller vegetation that are hanging in the road and could some sparks onto the other side. That's wildland firefighter Lily Clark again. Most people never experience wildfire on the ground firsthand. But firefighters like Lily get up close and personal with fire. So we're going to spend some time with her to understand why do we fight fire in the first place? And what exactly do firefighters do when they're out there in the woods? It's my first time using the chainsaw at night. It's an experience. And... Yeah, I am sleep deprived. The energy of the fire is what keeps me going. Lily's 27. She likes to say the color of her hair is unknown, but it's always curly. When she's not on a fire sporting a gray hard hat, there's a good chance you'll find her wearing her favorite orange beret. On deployments like this one, Lily lives and breathes fire, literally. She's slurping up smoke from nearby flames all day long. This is my third season as a wildland firefighter. And whenever I get to be with fire, I just feel 
all the feels of how much I love this job. The Forest Service doesn't take kindly to untrained university professors who want to get right up next to fires, which is probably a good thing. So I didn't actually get to be on the ground with Lily. What I know of her time on the fire is all from a series of voice recordings she sent. Good morning. It's 4.27 p.m. Sometimes exhausted, sometimes in her tent, sometimes right at the edge of the flames. It's really rare to get a glimpse behind the curtain at how firefighting actually works. Lily got a master's degree that focused on how communities become more resilient to wildfire. She wanted an understanding of fire that wasn't just academic. So she joined a fire crew. Four to six months a year, she and her crewmates travel the country fighting wildfires. The crew is based near the Swan Valley in northwest Montana, where Lily grew up. Fire was the thing that brought my community of 310 together and tore it apart. Fire was the thing that brought us the following summers to the mountains to play in the ash and find fire morels. Those are mushrooms, little morsels of culinary gold that thrive in recently burned areas. When she recorded this, she was at her camp, which is basically a small city of firefighters. Nearly 4,000 people from across the country had descended on the area to control the burn. My crewmate is playing metal in the background. This is a fraction of the standing army that travels all over the country and sometimes beyond. There are more than 30,000 federal workers who try to control wildland fire, and tens of thousands more state, local, private, and volunteer firefighters, too. The camp is set up so that as we work to take care of our public lands with wildfire, we also don't trample on them with over a thousand firefighters in one place. The August complex is actually not just one blaze. It started when a storm pummeled the forest with lightning strikes. More than 30 smaller fires started to simmer and then started to spread. Eventually, they all joined up into this one behemoth burn, hence the complex in the name. When little burns like those initial fires get detected, it sets off a chain reaction. Lily described what happens. You're the first on scene, and there's fire. There's smoke. There is the unknown of exactly where that, what that fire has been doing, how compromised the trees might be in that area. That's when you are hiking in with your tools, not really sure exactly what you're going to see, but knowing like it's going to be kind of bust ass when you get there. And you get to this fire, and it has been evaluated, and your captains are there to tell you to get at it. And that's when you start, get out your flaskies, your combis, your shovels, whatever is the tool that you have, and you start digging what we call a line around the fire. This term, fire line, is the bread and butter of firefighting. Digging line means scratching out anything that can burn. Sticks, plants, grass, pine needles. Creating a barrier you hope a fire won't cross. So some of you are leading with these tools and you're drinking out smoke and you are sweating from all the fire and then others are ahead of you with their chainsaws and they're clearing out the area for the brush, the compromised trees, anything that might either be in the way of the line or compromise the line by falling over it with fire. So you have those several very intense hours of being on the fire line and being hot and exhausted but also so excited by the adrenaline and flames that you're around. And once you have created this line and it looks like it's not going to travel anywhere, you watch to make sure there are not embers going over and creating what we call spot fires, which are the smaller fires that can be created and then blow up from those embers. When a fire blows up, when it gets past those initial defenses, that's when crews from all over the country swarm in. And that's exactly what happened on the August complex. When Lily got to this fire, Her crew drove 14 hours over two days to get here. When they arrived, they went straight to work on the night shift. So now I've been awake for 26 hours. Their first job was to do what's called a burnout. They lit their own fire that they could control. We do a burnout 
so that we've burnt the fuels in an area so that when a fire does come, it kind of just stops it in its tracks because there's not enough fuel left. That saying, fighting fire with fire, well, that's exactly what's happening here. Lily was on just one little corner of a massive blaze. The August complex is the largest fire on record in California history. Colorado also saw its biggest fire ever last year. In fact, almost every state in the West has seen its biggest wildfire on record since the year 2000. Lily sat with her phone one evening under the smoky night sky and talked about why burns are getting so out of control. The suppression of fire has given it fuel. As a country, we've been hell-bent on putting out fires for a century. But smothering those flames left us with a legacy we didn't expect. Without fire, ground fuels such as leaves and sticks, pine boughs, gather, as do the small trees and the other fuels that stack up below the trees and allow fire to climb from the ground up the ladder into the canopies, and that's when it runs. Runs means the fire takes off, it gets hotter, and the flames get bigger, and it starts to spread from tree to tree faster and faster. And what happens when it runs? It gets closer to human values. And then what? Then fire is the problem. Fire in itself is not an issue. It is only an issue when it begins to threaten human values. Human values. Those are things like homes and barns and property. The area where people live right up against trees that could burn is called the Wildland Urban Interface, or WUI. That includes about one out of every three homes across the country. So these are two of the factors setting up worse fire seasons. More homes where fires burn and fire suppression itself. There's something else making our fire seasons worse too, climate change. Forgive me, I'm being a little bit long-winded, but I'm a little bit uh, exhausted. That's California Governor Gavin Newsom declaring a statewide emergency last September. The state had seen about 8,000 fires so far that year, including the August complex. More than 30 people had died, and nearly 10,000 structures had been destroyed. He said the culprit was obvious. This is a climate dam emergency. This is real. Scientists say climate change means warmer, drier weather and more intense fires. Federal reports say that fire season is nearly 80 days longer now than it was in 1970. California's chronic drought, extended fire season from climate crisis, and the many fuels have brought us to a place where fire is almost beyond being managed. When those lightning strikes started the August complex, it was in the midst of the second hottest month of August on record in the Northern Hemisphere. September was the hottest we'd ever experienced. no longer call it fire suppression, we call it fire management. And yet who is being managed? Us or the fire? Who needs to be managed? I find that an enormous amount of simple, plain American wisdom comes right from that level of people who have to do the job. You talk to the people who have to do the job, and they can tell you a lot about what's really going on. John McLean has been writing about tragic wildfires for 25 years. When I hear him talk about that simple, plain American wisdom, I think about Lily and about firefighters like her. On the fire line, they see fires blow up and fizzle out. They see them run towards private property or out into the wilderness. They risk their lives. 
there's nobody more connected to the fate of fires. John zoomed with me from his home in Washington, D.C. And even though he spent decades listening to the wisdom of firefighters, he spent the bulk of his career in a big city doing another kind of writing. I worked for the Chicago Tribune for 30 years. He wrote about international intrigue, diplomacy. And I quit when I was in my very early 50s. Ever since, he's turned his attention to writing about wildfires across the West. And the reason I went from being the uh, diplomatic correspondent for the Chicago Tribune, flying around the world with Henry Kissinger, to uh, flying out west and writing about fatal wildland fires, uh, is a book called Young Men and Fire. His dad, Norman McLean, wrote that book. After Norman published his famous novella, A River Runs Through It, he became fascinated by fire. And he was increasingly confounded by the story of the Man Gulch Fire of 1949. That fire claimed the lives of 13 firefighters near the banks of the Upper Missouri River in central Montana. He spent decades trying to figure out how to tell the story. He did not live long enough to finish the book or to see it to publication. He had a very difficult time with it. Young Man in Fire was published after Norman's death. It made waves in the literary world. It gave wildland firefighting and the risk associated with it a new audience across the country. And it tethered John McLean to the world of firefighting. He became entranced by fire. Over the years, John had the opportunity to go back to Man Gulch and write about a bunch of other burns. He's published five books about wildfire since. But his relationship with fire started with his father. When I was growing up, you know, we were all scared of fire, but you never thought uh, that there would actually be one uh, to come down and, and burn everything out. The more he wrote about fire, the more that relationship with fire shifted. His ideas about it became concrete, even intimate. A few years ago, he realized how real the possibility was of a nearby fire consuming his family's cabin in northwest Montana. He told the local forest ranger, I don't want anybody backing up against my cabin to try to save it. The cabin is part of the woods. It's actually built from logs that were cut right around there, uh, the lodgepole uh, around Sealy Lake. Uh, it has been part of Sealy Lake for nearly 100 years. If Sealy Lake goes, if you know these giant larks that we have torch up uh, and it starts to threaten the cabin, I'm willing to let the cabin go. But that's, that isn't what I wanted. <laughs> if the whole thing went, I think that we should have accepted that we were part of that, that fire is not some strange foreign creature. It is part of the soul of man. Fire is part of the soul of man. To me, that one sentence captures so much about wildfire and John's relationship with it. Fire went from something nearby, but foreign and unwelcome when he was a kid, to something inseparable from existence itself. That ethic leads to another idea, too. If we can't escape wildfire, if it's part of us, then we have to learn to live with it, and at times to welcome it. I hear echoes of John's evolving relationship with fire in firefighter Lily Clark's story, too. In fact, she grew up only about 25 miles north of John's cabin in Montana. Fire was a reality for her then, too, but in a very different way than it is now when she's on an assignment. As a kid, it was something that was different and exciting in the sense that I saw my mom be worried and I saw my community be concerned, but it was something for me that was exciting in the sense that I didn't know was what would happen next. It was a great unknown. But when Lily was in college, a fire burned about a mile and a half from her home. It could have run right through her family's property. It was more or less a coin flip. And it was a real reckoning with knowing that I lived in a fire-prone area. My home was not well prepared for fire. We let the trees grow as they would. And 
I remember having a conversation with my mom and her just saying, you know what, if the fire takes our home, that's okay, because that means that we didn't necessarily put firefighters in there and their lives are worth more and we will rebuild or we will find a way. But it was a fear of mine to lose my childhood home, but also know that it was more important for that area to be left alone and let the fire do what it needs to do than put firefighters in there. Lily's seen firsthand the legacy of fire suppression across the country. All the built up fuels that in part contribute to our devastating fire seasons. But she's also been on the other side. She's experienced the immediate threat of losing her home. So as a firefighter, she feels these two competing forces. She understands that we put out too much fire, but on the ground, she's one of the people doing her best to stop the flames. I absolutely struggle with that. I absolutely struggle with seeing decisions made to put out wildfires in our wilderness areas, to put out wildfires in areas that have been adapted to fire that are often, that can be far away from communities and should be let burn in those areas. But I'm going to say that I'm not a firefighter to tell. I'm here to learn. Yes, as an ecologist, we can say those fires should have been let burn. But it's also true as a firefighter decision maker, you are tasked with that responsibility. And if that fire does go out of control, if that one ember does travel into a community and burns them down, you will be given direct responsibility for that fire going that way. Firefighting means straddling a thin line. While our understanding of fire and weather has gotten more and more precise over the years, there's always a degree of unpredictability in how a fire will burn. A strong wind or cruel spark could send things into chaos. But Lily says for her, the reality of firefighting tends not to be all that dramatic. On the August complex, they're snacking. Let's see. Ham and cheese sandwich, orange, bag of carrots, oat bars, peanut bars, more peanut bars. The fire lunch is actually good. There's a lot of dirty work in cleanup. We are mopping up. A mop up is when the glory of the fire has passed through and now it's the burnt land and you get on your hands and knees and crawl over it, walk over it, put your hands down to feel any warmth. And to be clear, it is not fun to do at night, so it is a very unglorious job. The bottom line isn't heroics, it's hard work. And working that close to fire makes Lily feel alive. Night seven was well, we mopped up. We watched for trees to fall on us. We slept a little bit. The night sky was blazing with a crescent moon. It was cold and wet. And off we go. Lily was on the August complex for 14 days. In her little corner of the fire, things were under control, but the work wasn't done. Last night, we had our last half shift of mopping up in the dark saying goodbye to the flames and the stars that have been our companions the last 13 nights. As Lily left the August complex, the fire season wasn't over across the country. By the end of 2020, the federal government had spent more than $2 billion suppressing the flames. The fires had scorched a bigger area than in any year since we started keeping track, more than 10 million acres. That's a landmass almost five times the size of Yellowstone National Park. Getting ready to be sent home is both filled with excitement and hesitation. The transition between being a firefighter and a present member of family and society is not easy. For two weeks, you're with a group of people living, eating, and going through an incredibly intense experience of being on the fire line. You go home to a group of people in a culture that are not of fire. When I hear this, 
a culture of fire. I think back to writer John McClain. Fire is not some strange foreign creature. It is part of the soul of man. The rest of this series is about that fire in our soul, how it got there, how we've lost sight of it, and how to find it again. When the question becomes, why is it this and not how it was? Well, then the question that must follow is, what has happened in between? So if we date the origins of modern American fire history from 1910, half of that history has been spent trying to take fire out of the landscape, and the last half has been trying to put it back in. It turns out, however, that it's a lot easier to take it out than to put it in. That's next time on Fireline. Fireline is hosted by Justin Engel. Writing, editing, and production is by Nick Mott and me, Victor Ibeas. Our fact-checking is by A.J. Williams. Original theme music is by Travis Yost, with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. And our cover art is by Jesse Stevenson. Additional support comes from Montana Public Radio, United Way of Missoula County, and The Trailhead. Narration recorded at Studio 49 at the University of Montana's College of Business. Special thanks to Lily Clark, John McLean, and Jeff Hole. If you enjoyed our show, please subscribe and share it with your friends.